Okay. Uh, good evening. It's Thursday, July 23rd. It's the uh, East Norwalk TOD Oversight Committee meeting. Uh, as you may know, the, the, we've had two public presentations on the plan that I think were last month. The Planning Commission is now considering amendment to the Plan of Conservation and Development to incorporate this plan into that document. Um, we got some comments back that we were going to go through tonight and then get some uh, recommended edits to send over to the Planning Commission. Um, and I don't know how you want to start, but I sent out uh, late this afternoon, I sent out a document which kind of was a quick summary of some of the written comments. I mean, I know there's some standard ones that we're going to talk about in greater detail later, um, but I, I grabbed the ones that were more some uh, some items we hadn't heard before, and just most of them I think are are you know especially like you know Nancy Rosette from the Bike Walk Commission put several together that I thought were you know seemed very reasonable and, and things to easily accommodate. Um, if it's easier, I can share my screen and put that up. If that's helpful for everybody, we can just scroll through. Okay, hopefully you can all see that, right? Okay, so these are the these are the ones that, um, and I, I I took out things like anything as I mentioned, anything grammar related, um, and items that were just. Steve, I think that now we're seeing something else. Oh. At least. You're yeah. we're seeing your other screen. The there, Zoom. We're seeing your Zoom screen. All right, hold on. Now let me. I lost it. I moved it over so I could look at it as well. All right. How about how about that? Right, now it's good. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be looking away, but I'll look to the screen. So. Um, you know the. There are a couple of the comments that she points to on page 62 about the, the you know, the roadway configuration. I, Vanessa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that probably has to wait until the final East Ave design is done. I think those will get incorporated in, and included. That's correct. But, and, uh, and we've been talking to Nancy. And there is really no final decision on the bike lanes yet. We, we're going to work with whatever is the width of the road. So we, it's just like baby markings after all. So no one is yet addressing that because we have so many other things to go through. So I don't, I don't have an answer on if there will be bike lanes or Cheryl's probably right under the bridge will not gonna be possible to have a bike lane because of the width, but we're trying to do something um, at least one or two blocks before. But as of now, we, we don't have anything um, finalized. It will be part of the East Avenue Roadway Project. So then, Vanessa, it sounds like on these comments, I should work with you to make sure that we have the right language to address the questions that are in here. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. You, okay. Either me or even, yeah. And then if I don't answer, I can forward to TMP because now that it goes under them. Okay. But yeah. Great. And the next one on page 64, I put that in the same boat because while it, I, it's a good idea, let's make sure that there's not any restrictions on why you, you can't do that. Okay. Um, and the next one she points to is section 7-2. Um, and I, it's a comment to, you know, for, for inclusion. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts concerns about what's what's listed there seems pretty you know pretty innocuous overall I think unless the committee members have any objection to putting that in it's an easy enough thing to add and it would make a lot no of sense objections. Um, and the next one refers to section 751. Uh, and you know what, I probably, it's going to be hard to switch back and forth between share screen on that. Emily, do you know what that one is off the top of your head? 
I could probably find another paper copy. Steve, are you looking for the Maybe paragraph? Just take a look at that. Oops. Sorry. I found it here if you need it. Yeah, I, I just found it. Yeah. So maybe we'll just take a look at that paragraph and see if that is not consistent or needs some clarification. Oh, Emily, you're muted at the moment. That it looks like That's something good. I should discuss with Vanessa just to make sure that we've got the right language there. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send this. I'll talk to TMP. We can have like a little conversation when we address those. Yeah, that sounds good. And her next one, um, I don't have any issues with it at all. We might want to think about, you know, that's, I think that's a decision beyond this group too, because I think that's a uh, Rex and Park decision as well. So maybe that's, if we put some language in there, it would, you know, not be anything binding, but something like consider better bike access through Vets Park or something like that. And the next one, uh, which goes to page 108, where it talks about uh, 108, okay, so Taylor Park, I think that's Taylor Farm Park. I think that's with more of a correction than anything else. Yeah, and I think these are both just clarifications. I don't know if anybody has any strong comments on that or not. No strong comments. Okay. Um, <coughs> and the next one is a comment from uh, Deb Goldstein. And I think, Emily, I think I sent, this got corrected already, right? This, uh, the number of cars, I think, I think we went through that already. We might have done, I'll double check. Yes, I think that might have been one of the comments, but I will just double check it, make sure. Yeah, I, knew, I think the number, she was correct, the number that was listed in the plan was higher than what was actually gonna be accom accommodated at the, at the new station platform. That's correct. Yeah. Can I make a, a suggestion on that as well? Because that, that 10 car statement there has been widely used in the past um, probably four weeks or so. Um, in some of the public meetings and some of the presentations you've had and I um, just want to make sure that when that correction goes out it's somehow publicized so that people know that it was corrected. A lot of people would have left those other meetings knowing or thinking that it's the uh, 10 car. Um, Do you know what page that was on, uh, Steve? Uh, it might be in more than one section too, but I uh, no. I'll have to dig the email out because I think I had sent a separate email a while mm -hmm. back when that first got raised. I, I don't remember the top of my head. Well, I'll double check just to make sure. Yeah, what we can do is put together a oh, list okay. of all the edits, what we've done similarly to in, in previous drafts, and then just list those and have those as a separate document if people want to go back and, and reference those. 
Okay. And Emily, I see it's on page five of the plan. Okay, I was I was deeper in the plan. It's okay. also um, page sixty-eight. Page five and sixty-eight. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Emily. It's also in the transportation appendix, Appendix B. Yep. Is in boy. It's on page ten. And they specifically speak to 10, um, to 10 uh, train cars to accommodate. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. I appreciate that. And so the next group of comments slash questions were from Audrey Cozine, um, some dealing with traffic, some dealing with or recommending or considering um, car-free zones, uh, increasing biking, you know, pedestrian mobility, which I think the plan does a, a good job of. And there's also, um, I have a fly buzzing around me, excuse me, talking about, uh, you know, making sure there's uh, pollinator use, clean air, and then also uh, affordable housing, which if we don't have it listed specifically in there, Emily, I think we should put a note that the and I'll make sure everybody agrees with this first, that the um, workforce housing regulations that apply to South Norwalk and then um, West Ave Wall Street should also apply to, to this area as well. Those are a little more, I wouldn't say not stringent standards, but a little more thoughtful standards than what's, what's allowed elsewhere. And I think that's the, the direction it may go in the long run citywide anyway, but I think that this area should have the same standard as those areas as well. Okay. I agree, Steve. Well, can, can you define them then in, in the same um, spot or put a footnote? Yeah. So folks don't have to go search it out. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, that's a good idea. That is a good idea. Okay. And then these are Stephanie's comments. Then Steph, and I took out. I left all the question comments in there. I don't know if you want to go through these, Stephanie, yourself, if you want to do that. I wrote them so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to, but um, the first one alluded to the fact uh, it seemed like we might be double counting points. Um, let me pull it up in front of me. It's three points, if I remember correctly, if we haven't changed them, it's three points each. But I see what I see what you mean when you're saying if there's some because if they have the same it. standards, yeah. then they're basically they get getting points. double yeah. points for doing one thing versus. Um, so we need to take out that conflict. Um, in so theory, yes. In th theory, leads sh lead should be applying to the building and site should be applying to the site. But in actual practice, I think you're right because lead does bleed over into the site a little bit. So we can look at how that's done. And uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find this page 10. So the I think what I suggested below refers to that, that maybe what we want to think about is a quantity of traits in that area versus a calculation based on, you know, the general. So like they have to do six to eight of these things, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, uh, the rent reduction item. Oh, yes. Let's talk about this one because I think you and I here are talking about, or you and the, the regs are talking about two different things. The rent reduction was intent, the way I had written it, was not for affordable housing. It was for um, uh, uses that the community might want, those ground floor retail uses that might not otherwise come in without a benefit such as a rent or reduction. So it was specific to commercial. So. And then in that case, I'll go back to my earlier um, desire, which was to say that much like the comment that just came before mine, that we do need some sort of affordable housing provision here as 
you know, something that is desirable and that we would encourage. Mm -hmm. But it sounds, and I would say that based on the standards in the other parts of the city, I personally don't think they go far enough. Um, so I would put in a vote <laughs> to expand that. Um, I forget what the exact ratio is, but you know, someone could put in uh, uh, whatever, yes, 10, Steph Stephanie, 10 I units think so. with one workforce housing. Well, I think at the moment, Stephanie and Steve can confirm this or otherwise, that you, it all relates to 20 apartments, then you can have 10%. And I would suggest even on, we should go down in East Norwalk to a lower number of apartments in any case where the 10% applies. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm right on that, Steve, but I think I remember that from Sono and from my interest in affordable housing. Yeah, that's, that's a, yeah. so the, the standard for most of the city is 20%. Uh, excuse me, 20 units, and then there were at the when we did the Sono TOD, the existing existing standard was 20 percent or 20 units, but we dropped it down to yes, I'm mixing stuff up badly at the moment. So it was 20 percent affordability at 12 units. So when we redid the regulations, it's at 12 units or more has to provide the workforce units at 10 percent affordability but we lowered the um, affordability thresholds in that area to hit a little lower uh, demographic because the state statute, which that's based off of, goes off the area median income and the area median income, even at 80% is still a really high number. So we, we dropped ours to state median income and we, we, we allowed them, if they went to, um, 60% state median income that they there were some uh, relief in a couple spots in the regulations. And if they stayed at 80%, they also had to pay a 1% fee that goes to an affordable housing fund. So then what are you recommending for this area? So the, this area, I would recommend that it match Sono and then the West Ave Wall Street corridor, so which is the 12 units, 12 units or more. I think it actually should be 10 units. I have no idea why they came up with 12, just an odd number. 10 makes more sense to me, but anyway, uh, 12 units and then use the uh, income levels at same as Sono and West yep. that Wall. I would go with that, Steve, but Stephanie is the authority here. <laughs> we, we did also recommend that it's not super relevant, but as part of the proposed uh, project up at Glover Avenue, we propose using those numbers there as well. Good, good. Hey, Steve, can I ask a question on that? Am I muted? Yeah. Okay. The, um, so when you, when you talk about the, the um, affordable housing standards, um, is there's a component of that that's a fee in lieu of, or is there an incremental fee that's a contribution because i know in the past it's been you know two controversial things having to do with affordable and um, workforce were the option to move units off site and we've kind of danced around that debate over the years um, and then the other option is a fee in lieu of um, of having them on site is that a component or there's or fees are only incremental funding the, the existing regulations have some different options in there and nobody's taken advantage of some of those options in terms of bonuses for additional units. And there might even be a, a fee in lieu option or an offsite option. I'll have to go back and look. Um, I don't like that model myself because I think that kind of segregates the uses out and it kind of pushes all the affordable units into one complex in different areas and doesn't really address the, address the, the main concern. Um, what we, the fee that I was just referring to is a fee that's based off the construction value of the project that goes into a, a separate, separate fund. So they'd still have to provide units on site, but if they don't provide that units at a lower threshold, they have to pay that fee into the fund, if that makes sense. Okay. But, but so then is the fee in lieu of providing the required number of units 
I guess that's what I'm getting at. It sounds like. Yeah, I'll have to look at. I, I'd, I'd have to read through that regulation again. That's. Okay. But that we're not proposing right. to change anything differently as part of this regulation here. Okay, and that's where. So when you say like an overlay of Sono and West Avenue, I really want to understand that because I would not be a proponent of um, fee in lieu of um, or an opportunity to move them off site. The last time we did that dance, it was from luxury um, high amenities in um, the heart of South Norwalk to units that would have been in, um, someone would probably describe it as a less desirable um, strip of Connecticut Avenue. So yeah, we're not we should proposing anything guard against that on the like front end. So, so Steve, okay. can I just suggest, just suggest, Steve, that when you find that regulation, you would just get, circulate it to all of us? Yeah, I'll forward it that. Yeah, we're not proposing Diane and I are interested. And I think yep, John exactly. Pleiades would be interested as well. Well, I can't talk for a counselor. Right. I, 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 I hear you, Steve, that you're not recommending any changes to it, but I can't recall what the final outcome of those were, so I don't know if that's in there or not. All right, well, I'll email out the existing regulation and that it should hopefully will be pretty clear off that. Thank you. Um, the next, uh, where is it? Um, Wait, can, can I just go oh, back sorry. to the rent reduction thing? I'm sorry, Stephanie. So, yeah, the, so the idea that that, would, that came in because it was to encourage being able to rent out the retail and service businesses. Um, I was just reading some interesting studies that suggest you're going to end up with empty storefronts because it's cost prohibitive for developers to have to deal with small um, storefronts versus larger, you know, um, larger pieces that maybe national chains can come into or regional chains can come into. And as I understood it from what I was reading, they just don't want to have to deal with, you know, that many types of things that would have, you know, fit ups and different lease negotiations and lease terms. And so I think it's important that we really push this as an option to make sure that the um, developers are using this as a tool to encourage locally owned um, startup mom and pop type businesses to even have a shot at having ground floor activation and to guard against um, having empty storefronts. Because it occurred to me, and maybe Steve and Emily can clarify this, even though there's a requirement in part of the, these zones to have activated ground floor, it doesn't actually, there's no enforcement that it has to be activated all the time. So if they're not renting them, but it would otherwise be an active use, are they in compliance even if it's empty for years? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it, if, if, so, no, yeah if, I mean, and that, that question and issue has come up on with the Waypoint project a lot when I think right. the second and that's third exactly phases the were one coming I was thinking in with that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that's got a whole other set of issues of why it's like that, but. Um, I wouldn't want to read repeat that because I think there was a whole bunch of goodies in the bag over there because they had ground floor activation and I still don't think um, all of those um, uh, uh, storefront things are, are occupied. I don't believe they are. How many years later? Anyway, that's my, that's my drift. If we can clarify that and if it's not legally, you know, enforceable to um, to um, enforce that they be active in some manner, whether they're whether the owner's making money or not, I, I just don't know how we deal with that. Yeah, I I'm I'll con I can confirm that with the, our attorneys, but I believe I asked that question before. I don't know if it's something we could enforce after the fact. So if they lost a tenant and then they they either a weren't trying to find one or they couldn't find one, I don't know how you can force them. It'd be hard to. You know, he could say I'm actively leasing or actively marketing it, and then it, I, I don't know. I think we'd have a tough time enforcing that. Yeah, I mean, guess. I think we could probably discern between a good faith effort and somebody who's just you know putting up a for a rent and then has you know forty eight dollars per square foot triple net or something, which you know, and then and then you'd have to have there'd have to be some penalty in there because you'd have to say here here are the bonuses that you received based on this ground floor activation and or maybe that a certain percentage of it always has to be active no matter what they have to do to maintain it. 
I'm not sure I'm just thinking out loud now, but I think everybody understands the concern here. Uh, the next item I wrote, we have talked a lot about how to encourage certain types of investments. I'll bring up the supermarket example because I think it's the most clear. And when I was looking through some of the site certification um, examples and whatnot, I, I came across this idea of providing a po points for people who build something or bring in something that is on that list of types of buildings that are desirable by the community. And since we have this very nice point system, I thought that may be, might be the place to put these things. And it provides a little pot sweetener for people who want to do something like that. So that's an interesting idea, actually. Um, you know, we've put in for the pedestrian amenities. We, of course, can't require by zoning, as we've already talked, you must put in X use, but a greater number of points for a specific type of use is a really interesting idea. And I think given, um, you know, that this is something that then moves into its own approval process and would have that separate public discussion. Um, I can see putting it in for, to allow for that discussion and what those uh, uses would be. So um, Steve, I don't know if you agree, but um, you know, it's, again, it's not something you put in the use section that you must have this. Yeah, the point yeah. system might be a way of, of sort of crossing that divide. I, my only concern would be, and it goes back to what we were just talking about, if say say you got that the, the coveted um, supermarket or whatever you want to call it, and then three years later they go out of business, are you going to tell them they have to put a supermarket back in there or they lose their, you got to take a story off your building? I, I, that's a little tricky. Well, yeah, and we'd have to think it through and look at, at what it was that, 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 you know, that Stephanie saw on sites yeah. and maybe there are some other things, but, you know, there must, to, to Diane's point earlier about the enforcement, there must be some mechanism out there that other communities have used. Now, whether or not that mechanism has used, been used in a different state with a different set of laws mm -hmm. is another question. So, you know, anything we propose has to be consistent with Connecticut law. So if it's a good example from, say, New Mexico, it may yeah, not yeah. But um, it is an interesting question overall if you have promised something in exchange for a bonus and then for some reason you don't deliver, what is the recourse? That's a general question that has to have been addressed at some point. And so your, your city council, a city solicitor um, might, actually, might have that information. You know, there's, there's another way to think about it too, because like to Steve's point, if that, if that uh, small grocer went out of business, you couldn't then enforce it to say you have to find another one or nothing. But maybe right. what you can say is that if the time comes where you can no longer meet the condition, then the use has to revert back to um, A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. And we have options that would be agreeable to you know, maybe the average um, property owner, but also to the community. So you can say, for example, in the, because we know it's coveted to have a small grocer um, there. Maybe we say in the event that that grocer goes out of business and despite good faith efforts, you can't find a, a suitable similar replacement, that the ground floor use has to convert to community space. That's, um, you know, used within the community or it could be a community food co-op or it could be you know, meeting space or civic space or something. I'm just, I'm just, again, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea, but mm -hmm. maybe if there were three things that you say, if you, if in the future you don't meet that condition, you can still qualify and not have a penalty if you do something else. And I think, I think really that would really strongly support where Stephanie is heading with this, that it's, a, that would be a win-win because on, on the front side, Stephanie, we're really making an effort to try to get in some of the, the, uh, the uh, type of uh, amenities and experiences that the community asked for, but it would still be flexible enough to work with the property owner, I think. 
Well, I think there's two things that's really interesting about that, Diane. One is the idea of the options, the fallback. So if you, 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 know, you promise this, you can't do this, then you have to do one of these three or four things, whatever that might be. I think the other thing is defining a good faith effort. And, um, you know, you could say that, okay, an economic downturn hits, the grocery store is no longer viable, we can't get a new one in, what is the appropriate amount of time that they should be actively marketing the space? Is there a way of going ahead and defining that and say, okay, you've got six months to a year to fill the space, and if not, it reverts. And then also, what are the conditions um, under which that vacant space should be left? So do you leave it um, with the, the no shades on the windows and a pile of furniture in the middle, which I've certainly seen in downtown? Do you require there at least be shades on the window? Do you require that the windows be lit and staged with something that's active? You know, what are those conditions mm -hmm. under which a vacant space should be left? I think that might be a really interesting question. Excellent. Yeah. 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 That's a worthwhile conversation right now in, in the city today, Steve, to have. Yeah, I realize um, that should be included it, regardless. <laughs> exactly. If I may interrupt, um, I, in regarding of how to decide how long is acceptable for a property owner to have a property on the market and that kind of thing, that's based on a compatible, compatible market analysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot say from one year from now what the market is going to be saying. You have to look at the, you know, what's the... Um, uh, DOM, I'm sorry, I'm talking real estate. What's the um, um, normal days in the market, the middle, you know, most of the time and that kind of thing. So I don't know. I don't, I mean, I'm just telling you that as a real estate agent, how, how does that work? But it's not like you can just say, yeah, go ahead. I think that's a good point though, is that you don't have to specifically define it in the zoning, but you can define the criteria. You can say you need to show based on standard Good market effort. practice or best market practice, you need to show that you are making best faith efforts to do this. And if not, you need to fall back to whatever the next state is. And in the meantime, you need to keep that activated space in X sort of condition. I think we can make it general enough to be acceptable by the zoning while still providing reasonable criteria. Um, and I think that's an excellent point. Right. Okay. But um, too, how are we going to enforce that? I, 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 okay, let's say that this happens. Yeah. Let's go through this. So we have the property that is open. They cannot get a grocery store. They try, I don't know how many tries, two tries, 20 tries. So now they decided to rent to somebody else. What will be the mechanics that will have to be established now because they own the property, right? They can just sign the lease or we're gonna force them to go back to, I don't know, to PMZ, Planning Commission. I'm, I'm asking how, how we're gonna make that change. Why can't it be part of the design review then if it's within the, if we're talking about specifically within the village district, why, why couldn't it be then that you have to come back through the um, for the bodies that would examine an application for... No, but let's say, Diane, that the building is, comp is already built. We right, had right. first a grocery store there. Right. And now after three years, they left the space. Right. So that's what I'm now trying to see. Okay, we, by the regulation, they have only to have the space rented to another grocery store. But that is not happening. It has been two years... Now the space is open, but now I don't know a uh, right. ballet school when it comes in. So what the landlord will have to do to allow the ballet school to be established at? Right, right. That's a because good. it doesn't go anymore now to yeah, because you will not have land the review there. The so no, this or, is where the the legal enforcement. You're absolutely right, uh, Vanessa comes in. So. Here, here, the question may be, can the use only be limited for a certain amount of time? So for example, um, you know, they're getting a benefit for this. So they're getting something ex mm -hmm. in exchange. So 
is it that the grocery store to just stay with that has to be there for five years and after that they can rent to anybody else but if it's earlier than five years they have to follow these restrictions or it's 10 years or whatever whatever the appropriate cycle is is it that they have to give some sort of um, restriction that goes with the, the property deed uh, you know what are the conditions under which this could be created and I think that's where we're going to need somebody who's yeah. versed in the specifics of Connecticut land use law to make sure yeah. that we're on target with this because yeah. we can we can put it in that we want these conditions but the enforcement is the, the key piece of it and so we need to know how would you structure that if it were something where the city owned the property and they were disposing of it they could have uh, an LDA that stated the conditions but if it's private property that's a completely different question so we need to know the legal mechanism that says you got a benefit and therefore you need to follow up with these conditions but these conditions may not be allowable in perpetuity so what is the reasonable length of time that they have to meet those conditions in order to get that benefit and i think that's a reasonable question to raise i think that's why i love the fact that it was judith who brought this up because the the um the wording can be stringent enough that says you have to come back to the table in the event that these things happen but you have to then reach out to say um here, here are the, the people you should con consult with um, that can come back with a list of possibilities that would be considered by zoning or a review board. Because at that point, I think Judith, and may, correct me if I'm wrong, but someone in your position and realtors and, other, and others would um, have a handle on what the trends are. Because you're right, three years down the road, you don't, you don't know what the trends are for what's going to be popular and going to be a successful, a successful business. Um, but but you would then so you know I think I think working at, you know with, with realtors or other recognized um, professionals to say you know take a look at what's out there what's trending and what the community would desire and then just have that come back thing, through either zoning or a review board like not unlike the design uh, process I think it can be done yep I think, it, I think it's just got to be stringent on the front end and kind of loose enough on the back end that it's not so restrictive that we're saying it's, you know, literally A, B, or C. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. to Judith's point, five years down the road, oh my gosh, look at how things have changed in the past five years. Or even the past yeah. five months. So, <laughs> yeah. so I mean, yes. I, I, you know, I love the ideas that you came up with and maybe Steve and I need to talk about how we, we hit the research to make sure that they're doable before we put them in, before, you know, I, I make the alterations to put them in print. But, um, uh, you know, because again, I don't, certainly don't want to recommend something in zoning that's not going to be allowable under Connecticut law, but I like the creativity of uh, addressing this. Uh, I think everything else, let's see, page 13. Ah, yes. So I could be misremembering, but I thought in the maybe last spring, we had talked about a certain number of bonus points if someone wanted to go from two and a half to three, um, and then additional bonus bonuses had to be met to go from three to three and a half. But that does not seem to be written in here anywhere. So. I just wanted to double check that. Did I miss, uh, did we combine it at some point? No, but um, what we did, and I'm trying to find the zoning amendment or the zoning, um, here it is. I think what we did was we tied certain number of bonus points to a certain density. And then if you provide more amenity points, you get a higher density. But I think we, if I must, I just misremembering myself was that, you know, we, the, early on we had the discussion about three stories versus three and a half stories. And yeah. the, if the problem is if you go to three stories versus having the half stories, you're going to get a flat roof. Right. And, and which, you know, in some cases, a flat roof is fine, but if somebody's allowed to build the three, they're, they're going to build the flat roof. That's what you're going to get. You're not, the, the half story allows for 
uh, gables, dormers, more interesting roof lines, and, and so forth. That was, I think that was my recollection of things. That's what I remember as well, is going from two and a half to three just basically got you a flat roof instead of the dormers that you'd have at a two and a half building. And so it was the two and a half to the three and a half allowed you to have the traditional pitched roof. Which it is what we have at the moment at the Sono and with Spinnaker at 233. It's a flat roof. And I heard also that people were not looking like kind of a shape box kind of thing. And I thought that was why we were going above the half story. The house yeah, story is very desirable. It, oh, go ahead, Brian. I was just saying the half story I think is very desirable for the reason you said, Steve, to get the roof lines attractive and not flat. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the, the, the Spinnaker building is a five story building. So five stories flat is a lot different than three and a half stories because if you cut somebody off at three, you know, that extra half story would gives them a lot more flexibility in terms of design and also gives them more um, FAR where the three is going to, it's going to cut them a lot more. Yeah. The three, they will build a flat roof. Um, the pitch roof allows for the um, breaking up of the mass, or that allows for that change in roof line. Um, it will, it will be a better building if it's not forced to be a flat roof, basically. You know what, Emily? This um, this uh, topic of the three to three and a half actually was um, a lengthy discussion. Um, maybe not lengthy, but I came up for discussion at the um, ENNA board because uh -huh. we were talking about the. Um, the fact that um, a lot of people are not opposed to that extra height there because of the architectural detail and dormers and things. And I'm flipping through my paperwork now. I want to try to find it because I, I um, ended up then Googling to try to find some examples of where you might hold to three but still have architectural interest and not have the flat roof. And I came up with um, like five different um, communities, you know, names you would mostly recognize, um, where where they had like their like their main street, not, not like their main corridor, but like neighborhood type main streets, very charming, um, and with um, with three stories that all of them I thought were very attractive and not the boxy flat roof. They they incorporated you know um, architectural aspects that made them interesting and dimensional. Mm -hmm. And it is on this desk somewhere. So if I emailed it into you and Steve, can you take a look at it? Yeah, absolutely. Just Happy so to. when we're considering height still going forward, because we know what the height issue is. Um, well, can I? The, I'll, get those I would, to you, I'll get those to you tonight so you can see them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about a, a, you know a two and a half story. Uh, people get confused and then they get caught up with the numbers, but. What's real, what's the real difference between two and a half and three? There, in essence, if the it's all you how you measure the height. So if you know most instances, if you have a flat roof, you're measuring to that you know top of the roof level. With the um, two and a half, you might be measuring it to the peak of the roof or the midpoint of the roof. Right. So it's wherever you set that height number. So if you have a two and a half story where the building height is 35 feet and you measure that height at the midpoint of the roof, and then you have a flat roof with the same building height, you may actually get a taller building the, the other way around. So you, you have to be careful with how you do that. So you, you, you can have a two and a half story building that's actually taller than a three story building. Right, that's true. Um, yeah, Diane, I'll be interested to see the communities that you have and what their regulations are. Okay. So. And, you know, Steve, I just heard what you said there, and I, there's something just occurred to me that maybe didn't before. So when, when you're doing the jump from two to two and a half or three to three and a half, you're never looking at that as higher density based on a half floor, right? Or half story? It could, it's only aesthetics I mean, or, is it, or is it additional density? It, it could be. It depends on how intricate the roof design is because if you think about a flat roof, it's basically a box. So you have probably have three equal levels and however many units you can build in there, depending on if they're studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, or whatever the heck they are. Um, with the peaked roof, it all depends on how you angle the roofs. That 
You know, the steeper the pitch and the shallower the roof, the less area you're going to get under that roof. But when you build out dormers and you um, make the roof, you know, there's different kinds. You could do mansard roofs, all different kinds of roofs where you get more volume underneath that roof as opposed to if you think about a really steep A-frame pitch, you might not get as much, you might not get as much area underneath that. In fact, to that point, the space I'm in now doesn't technically count as livable space because right. the uh, the wall height is actually not, I don't think it's even four feet. It might be about four feet. It's not the five foot minimum. So um, because but if of the you split the difference with the other floors, like is a typical story then, is it, is, is it 10 feet? So here's the interesting thing for the area that you're looking at. So most retail floors now are 15 feet. So okay. if you're looking at a 35 foot building that gets you a ground floor of 15 feet, so right. for the, the ground floor activation, and then this is floor to floor, obviously, 10 foot floor to floor to uh, the other two to get up to um, 35 feet for two and a half stories. But that means your half story, you know, again, to um, uh, Steve's point is going to be tricky um, uh, if you're, you know, depending on how you're pitching that roof. So um, because the floor to floor isn't your livable space, it's also right. including all the mechanicals that happen right. in the building. So your right. livable space is actually a lot. You're not getting tip foot ceilings when you walk into that uh, next floor up, right? So it, yeah. gets, uh, it right. gets really tricky. Yeah, it's it's having grown up in most of my life in apartments, it seemed to me that the ceilings were six feet and eight feet. That's, I don't know <laughs> if that's just what it felt like, or if that's, you know, if it, if it was, Weren't they eight feet? I don't even know what it is in here in the room I'm sitting in. Older buildings tend to differ. I think um, some, uh, it feels tight at seven foot build a, a height, you know, in the clear space. Mm -hmm. Many are eight. Um, for higher end, it tends to be nine feet. Okay. So, and then of course the ground floor, 15 feet is a starting point basically right. now. Because they have for someone to split difference on on the uh, residential if there were two residential floors to split the difference and reduce the ceiling height there to get additional um living space on what wouldn't have been usable is what well, it sounds that's like why you now have the the story limit as well as the height limit okay. because people can play all sorts of interesting games with height if you yeah. don't also have a story limit so it's a yeah. second secondary limitation on it okay thanks hmm. I think the only other thing we need to talk about here, um, the one thing that came out a lot, um, and I take somewhat personally, was um, sort of a distrust of the zoning commission. <laughs> and I was not on zoning from years ago when some of this uh, mistrust uh, first occurred, but it seemed to me a simple fix for some of the concerns that came up in some of the public meetings might be to either require a supermajority or um, a unanimous vote for any of the types of changes that were concerning to the community. So I throw that out for consideration. Now, Stephanie, you're talking about if, if somebody wanted to get the extra story and the density. I'm assuming that's what you're saying, right? I don't remember. Um, I referenced 4B, so I, I, I can't remember offhand, and I just had to close my screen, but uh, something like that. I would say I, yeah. I would reserve that for whatever guideline needed yeah. the most protection. Stephanie, it's the amenity. Um, what you referenced, we have, I'll just read it to you quickly. Uh, 4B is the applicant records a covenant on the land records, which ensures the continuous operation and maintenance of the amenity and that such covenant shall run with the land. The applicant will be responsible for the continuous operation and maintenance. The amenity once designated shall only be changed with the approval of the commission. So that, that was a specific point that you were referencing. But, but it would comments. be more stringent um, approval. It wouldn't just be majority, I think she's suggesting. Right, exactly. It should be, yeah. Exactly. 
I agree because, you know, even just the disputes with the mistrust that happens over the subjective decision of what's a minor and a major change has created angst and misery. So I, I definitely agree with this one, Stephanie. I've, I've used language in the past and I've used it, I think in Norwalk as well as past lives is where, um, in which by, you know, some paraphrasing, but by a two thirds vote mm -hmm. of the commission or something like that, as opposed to just the, you know, more positive than negative. So we could, I don't, I don't have any problem incorporating that language in. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a good suggestion. A unanimous would be almost impossible in this day and age. Yeah. It's plus if, if, it, it, if you had a, you know, I, I would always be, I, I'm not a fan of this, but if you ever had elected um, officials on there and, and then politics got into the decision making and then everybody was voting pol pol political lines, then you're going to, you know, that, that could lead to some problems. Well, hopefully that would mm -hmm. never happen. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah. they're all political appointees, though, Steve. So in theory, um, it happens anyway. So I'm saying just, if the structure ever the changed, so, yeah. if, if it ever changed where, you know, some communities have elected um, commission members. So if you ever had that case, and I, I know this from neighboring communities where that's a problem sometimes. And I'm sorry, as Steve knows, I have to step into another meeting briefly, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you okay. for your question, Stephanie. Sure. The good timing. Um, and uh, Emily, I don't know if you had a chance. I don't know if I sent these to you, Emily, or not. But there was a. Um, and you were on the meetings, though, where the the uh, the architect in the area, Lou Garcia, had yes. raised concerns about the ability to park these projects and I know you you and I had talked about it. I don't know if you had any further thoughts on on that. So um, yeah actually I want to share it with the committee because it's a it's a good question. Um, I was planning on going back to the uh, you know we had the chapter in the um, document on the susceptibility to change and um, as Steve and I were looking at this question after those um, meetings that we had uh, I realized that there was some more information uh, that we had done, uh, Harriman had done, that I had, wasn't aware uh, existed in terms of the build-out study. So I was planning on taking that susceptibility to change chapter and just beefing it up a little bit with some more information about the build-out. And as part of this, I would be looking, re-looking at the parking studies that we did just to double check that um, they are what we are. I think one of the things, um, as, as a, again, as I was looking back at that, is that um, uh, the studies I think that Mr. Garcia did tended to be on a single parcel. Judge, just simply judging by his comments, he was looking at one parcel um, and the amount of parking and the studies that we did, at least some of them, not all of them, had assembled multiple parcels. And when you do that, there's a greater efficiency in terms of the parking. So that may be where some of the disconnect is. But I wanted to just delve a little bit further into the actual details, uh, just to double check. And as I said, beef up that chapter um, uh, with a little bit more information about the susceptibility to change and how we use it. I think it would be more valuable to all uh, if I did that. Sounds good to me. Steve, is it reasonable that a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight then would be available for the public to review it ahead of the um, the August, I forgot the first one up, the planning commission is August 5th or 3rd? 5th, yeah, and I was just oh. writing myself a note that that, I mean, some of the minor stuff, I don't think, you know, I'm not so much worried about typos right. and getting that stuff. Yeah. I can make an itemized the, list of that, the biggies, but the significant yeah. changes, I'd like to get that codified and, and to the bodies that are going to look at it as well, so I don't, I don't want to throw changes to them after the fact. Yeah, because you literally could have someone at the public hearing who's hearing a, a uh, like a bombshell for the first time, and um, because the public can't speak again after um, your rebuttal as the, I guess you're, you'll be doing the rebuttal as the applicant, they can't speak again, so I think it would be, in fairness to the public, something, you know, something major would have to be beforehand. 
or yeah, I wasn't thinking or if there's something that comes up at the first one that's major, then we, we do have to go back, Steve, and make an accommodation for people to further comment at the second one. And um, that wouldn't be a precedent in Milwaukee. Um, both the zoning and planning commissions have done that in the past. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with that so long as it, we're not just repeating what we heard at the first meeting. You no, know, it would have to be only for something that was introduced new, just like in a you know any other applicant, like a, you know, for land use that comes in with a developer. It'd have to be something that was new, which should so never really planning, happen, but it does. So the planning commission meeting is on the fifth. That was not on my calendar. <laughs> no, I changed Oops. the calendar, Emily. I don't think I told you yet. <laughs> Aha! So if you can't make if you can't make it, I'm going solo. <laughs> and then again on the eleventh. I will have a look. I'm more concerned about giving getting you the uh, edits in time for it. So, but we can talk about that offline. Yeah, I don't think like some of these edits. I'm not so much worried about getting incorporated now. Um, right. Like the that one we just talked about. That's a pretty significant one. And, and yeah, we, we can circle back tomorrow or Monday or something, whatever your schedule works. And okay, that talk sounds about good. That we'll talk logistics. Gotcha. Okay. Um, next one uh, was from Kevin Barber from TTD with a correction about um, power oh, yeah, supply, which I, yeah. I don't think anybody's going to object to us doing what yeah. he asked for that. Um, and these are a little more miscellaneous items that came up. Um, uh, Rita Gant had uh, had some questions about the you know impacts on the school system from allowing additional units and also impacts on utilities. I think that the plan addresses the utilities um, pretty clearly in there. The, uh, the, the school impacts, it's hard to project that over this development and how it will develop, you know, versus some other projects I could think of. Um, you know, we've, the, the, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody is going to say that there wouldn't be additional school children as a result of this. I, I don't know if these kind of developments are, you know, conducive to that, but I, you know, I, I, there definitely will be additional kids that come, but we've found, you know, based on studies through Board of Ed data that, you know, the, the apartments generate less uh, school children than most other types of developments do that provide residential. Mm -hmm. That, that is standard um, uh, understanding in the industry that the TOD type, um, uh, whether it's the condo or the apartments, tend to be fewer uh, school children than, say, single family homes, for example. Yeah. Um, then there's a Mr. Mitchell and Miss, I'm going to, uh, Roskowitz, I think is how you pronounce the last name. Uh, they were questioning the, the parking requirements and didn't agree with the 1.3 spaces per unit, but that's already on the books. It's not, uh, we're not proposing that as a new, new standard for the zone. So just, right. just to clarify that, that question was out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Russell Morris, I thought had an interesting, I don't know if I've ever thought about it this way before, but how do you, maybe I should have incentivize ownership versus rental. I, I mean, we, it's hard to control that on an applicant phase, but I don't know how you um, incentivize it. To me, I, I'm, so, I'm so thinking in East Norwalk in particular, and I mentioned this the other night, that it seems to me that East Norwalk would be more conducive to ownership than some other areas, because I think the, the beach amenity to me would be a big draw for people if they wanted to, you know, if you're downsizing from somewhere and you want to be able to walk to a beach, that East Norwalk provides that much better than a lot of other places. So I, I would hope that would happen, but I, I don't, Emily, I don't, I don't know if you've heard of that or anybody else knows of any ways to incentivize. I see Judith raising a hand. I just wanted to ask if maybe the point system can help with that because, you know, that'll take some of the questioning about the uh, uh, tax incentive or like, you know, ownership versus rental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's worth looking at, Judith. Uh, can, again, we've been using the point system as a way to uh, nudge potential development into the area that we want it to be in, so we can look at that. I can also poke around at some of my resources and see if there are other things. Certainly, we should mention in the plan, and uh, I'll double check to make sure it's in there, 
that there's a preference for um, ownership units rather than rental units. I think that came out fairly clearly in the public discussion. But I think the point system is a good way of looking at it. So yeah, and the only yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, my only concern with that would be similar to what we were just talking about a little while ago. Is if ten, five years after the project's built and then somebody buys up all ten of the units in the building and then they say now it's, I'm going to it's no longer going to be condos. I'm going to change the ownership structure and I'm going to rent out all the units. How do you claw that back? I can't back argue with that. You, yeah. 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 That's exactly. my only worry. I, I like the idea of the incentivizing, but I just want to be able to make sure you can actually enforce it down the road. Yeah, I think that's that that's going to be the hardest question, I think, for everything that we're putting into place is how do you get beyond the use the the, the regular life cycle of a tenancy, um, whether it's for the commercial or the residential. And uh, change that. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Then we'll just have to do further research to see what those options are. And you know what else comes up with this too, Emily? Because this has come up a lot at E and A because there's a perception of, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. People think that people who own things have a more vested interest in their community. And again, as a, a renter for you know most of my life, maybe not most anymore. I have to do the math now. Um, <laughs> But um, I always felt vested and, um, you know, in the property and in the community. So I don't want to indict people who are renters. The, the other thing is, is when you look at the possibility of incentivizing um, home ownership, then are we talking about the fact that it would be enforced um, owner occupied mm -hmm. versus, you know, an individual who owns it, but they're an absentee, you know, landlord or it's an Airbnb or some other mechanism where there's still someone there who um, is a renter. So I think people were thinking more of like owner occupied. And part of it is just the root cause question of like to understanding what, what happened economically where there was such a massive shift away from condominiums to apartments. Mm -hmm. And that's way above my pay grade. I don't understand any of that, but we have <laughs> Judith luckily to, to help us through. Yeah, you're that. actually, I think you're better off in some sense if you had a rental, like just thinking of a like a a, a building that was owned by one entity and they're renting it. I think they're gonna they're more apt to take better care of the property than a condominium that was all rented out to different people. There's less incentive for those people to maintain things. I I, I know just my view of those kind of projects. It's a good point. I've known an, any number of people who have lived in condominiums and the condominium association um, has left a lot to be desired in their management of the property and the That's resources. The issue. So yeah, everybody suddenly comes along and you're getting hit with these special assessments because 20 years ago, you know, the then condo association didn't do the maintenance they were supposed to have done. So um, yeah, because at that point, it doesn't matter if it's a renter or not, it's still the owner. It has a right. responsibility to the board and has to comply with all the bylaws. Right. So a, a management, a rental company who owns and manages their buildings and obviously has an interest in keeping them nice to keep the, the tenants and the, the, the rents where they want them to be is uh, could actually be preferable. It's an interesting discussion. Um, I'll, I'll poke around a little bit more and see how we address that. So Maybe Jessica. another thing to think about. Go ahead, Diane. I was going to say maybe Jessica Casey could weigh on, in on it, maybe in her experience besides tax incentives or some other mode of um, seeing if we could get a good, this is just part of a mix. This is what we keep hearing, diversity and, and balance. Mm -hmm. So this would be one component of a mix of different, not just styles, but ownership opportunities. You know, another concern I have with, with, with putting that in as, a, as part of the bonus thing is say, whatever period of time, five years, 10 years down the road, you know, there's no staff that's familiar with any of these projects or what was approved. And Diane Cece is no longer watchdog for East Norwalk. And one of these projects changes hands and then nobody knows that there was some kind of restriction on the property because if it's just a tenant swap out that conforms to the regulations otherwise, but they weren't aware that they got an extra half story of building height because they put in a grocery store. 
that's really hard to enforce long term. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's something that can slip through the cracks really easily. So I'd, I'd be leery of tying in bonuses for those kind of things, because that's really going to be hard to enforce. So then maybe what then comes in is that there's a point system for the community benefits as Stephanie raised, um, but the community benefits aren't defined in the zoning, they are outlined in the plan. So somebody, they come, they come before the um, uh, uh, planning commission, zoning commission, and they sit there and say, we're going to do community benefits. Then the planning, the, the, the answer comes back, well, what community, community benefits are you going to do? Say, we don't know, you tell us. And they say, well, on page X of the plan, these are the 12 community benefits this community really wanted. You know, you, you need to come up with some combination of those. Um, you know, that might be a way of doing it rather than putting the specific requirements and points. But you do still have the enforcement issue. And I think that's a, a real key piece that we need to, to look at is how permanent are the benefits that are being, you, ideally you would want to tie the benefits received to the permanency of the uh, um, the bonus or the granted, so or the benefit that they they get granted. So if it's an extra story of height, which is pretty permanent, ideally the benefit should be pretty permanent as well. So again, you know, it's kind of a, a catch twenty two. Some of the things we want can't be guaranteed to be permanent. So how do we deal with that? Emily, I just thought one thing very clearly is to put a time constraint on what is 100% tight and legal, because mm. that's good. Yes, things can change. We we'll go for good, good, good efforts afterwards. But of course, you never know. A business, a whole environment could change very rapidly in six or seven years' time. But a five-year commitment for the benefit of the points—that's a reasonable time period in most economic lives, I believe. But that's the thought. Yep, that's a great thought. I take Steve's point, point that the, the reality of 10 years out or 12 years out, okay, hopefully we've done good things by then and it's all nicely built in and things will evolve from there on. But that's my optimistic sort of view of life. I think if you uh, um, are looking for a 10 year prediction and you ask five economists, you'll get eight different answers. <laughs> The nature of forecasting is always wrong. <laughs> yes. So, Steve, what is this about evacuation routes? Right. Yes, that came up at the presentation at East Norwalk Business Association. And Judith, I forget the name of the gentleman that mentioned it, but he he said, you know, that that you know East Ave corridor is a, one of the evacuation routes for if there's a hurricane or something. I've never seen that right, put into this type of plan before. I'm sorry. It was um, it was Jim Anderson, and okay. and then he lives right like literally by the cemetery, I lighthouse I think I don't know how you call it that street. Um, but that's where he lives, and so he had seen you know all of the flooding, and I remember when I just had only one exit, which was the East Avenue or um the straddle of Finna bridge so yeah but i don't know how can we make more evacuation routes or just maybe just um i think he was talking more about um signals and that kind of thing like something like that do you have a map yeah. that shows some there should be something okay uh, i can let's leave this put a on my to-do list. I'll, I'll try to see if we can, if okay. there is any evacuation yeah. routes. I, was thinking I don't know added. if we can add, you know, the, the add part, I, I don't know how does that work. I think that it's not just a city thing, it may be a state thing. I'm so, wondering if you just meant to put them in the plan, you know, what the, what the existing yeah. were to the plan. Yeah. We can easily right. do a map to show that. Right, yeah. which I'm sure you already have them in place. It's just uh, have right. them there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just we'll we just have the, the, where they are. We, we have the emergency management officers knows very well what the emergency routes are based on Storm Sandy, and you can't necessarily predict if suddenly we had an earthquake which we never had before. But probably the flood is the classic, 
Uh, there are certain routes out, knowing flood levels that occurred before. Um, but the, economic, uh, the emergency management should know. They've got it well mapped out. In my opinion. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking we could add it to one of the existing maps. We have the storm surge maps and the flooding maps. I mean, we could put a note, add that, and show the line. Some differentiate. I think that's fine. That's exactly where I put them, frankly. Godfrey Avenue is basically a dinghy. Hey Steve, why couldn't you add it to the um, to the list of um, things that you examine as each development comes in? Then that you just have it as a checkpoint to say. Um, um, how would the city designate the preferred um, evacuation route for that particular development? Because the idea is that, because a lot of people, and I've had this discussion with Jim Anderson in the past, Judith, is about the idea that most people are just going to gravitate towards the East Avenue to I-95. But the fact remains that, you know, you can come out of, um, you know, Southern East Norwalk and you can take a right and get to Westport and get out that way. And then, like a, a um, even a unit like 230 East Avenue might actually be directed to go over the Straffolino Bridge and exit that way, so that you're diverting um, pockets of people going in three different directions. So, well, let's, if, let's, if you examined each application coming in, and that was one of the questions to say, based on the size of it, what would what would the city's recommended des you know designated evacuation route be through emer emergency management services? They would have to know and they'd probably have to manage that on their own within their own you know building with their with their tenants and things and residents yeah i don't know how that would work on a application by application basis but let's find the map first and see what it says my guess is there's probably not 30 routes that come out of east norwalk i think they're going to want you to go in three one or two yeah. directions and then right. you know filter from there but we can find that easy enough mm -hmm. i just think it's um, came up during one of the east. Yeah. Right, right. And it, somebody mentioned about, and it was in one of the public presentations about, yes. and I made a note to remove the fountain as an amenity, and I kind of chuckled when they said that, but I, I don't have an issue. If, you, if everybody feels the fountains should come out, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm not a big fountain guy myself. <laughs> I just had a question on that because we actually had fountains for both indoor and outdoor uh, pedestrian oh, spaces, so did you want them removed from both? I, I'm not going to, it's fine with what everybody wants to do. No. What's the reason for the removal of the fountain? Is it the power of the uh, electricity which conducts the water around and the evaporation, so it's water usage? It was seasonality. Seasonality, okay, yeah, if you close thing. them up in winter, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah, kind I mean, of a headache it, in some may, senses. You know, maybe we still encourage it for, for the benefits that it has, or it just has like a 0.5, you know, point or something, but I'm not sure if everyone would want them out, especially if it's, you know, recirculated water, or if it's part of, you know, um, rain garden or stormwater management system that provides some other benefits. Hey, Steve, there was, a, there was a bunch more letters though. Were you at the end of the list there that were, or did you just grab a handful or? No, so the, what, what you see, I mean, most of the letters and most of the comments had to do with this. So that's, everything else was lumped in with this. So that's, you know, to me, that's the crux of the discussion. Okay. I like that one. <laughs> nice graphics. Yeah. Um, that, Steve, you did that? No, that's, that's called Google. Google uh, I was going to say, because if that planning and zoning thing didn't work out here, this is. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, my, uh, my artistic ability stops at copy and paste. That's as far as it goes. I can do stick men poorly. So, I mean, we've, we've, we've talked about this a bunch. I mean, and I know that, you know, I'm not going to go off on on it very long, but there's, you know, there's a strong, there's a strong opposition in some areas to adding any height or adding any density. I think, you know, we've laid out our reasons why it, it, it's proposed as it is. So, I mean, you know, we have two, at least two, probably three public hearings coming up where, you know, people are going to be able to voice their opinion again. Um, I don't see any reason to take anything out of the plan at this stage, um, but you know, 
everybody else is, can chime in. As I said in my update to the, I'm oh, sorry, Judith, after you. Okay, thank you. If I may I ask a question, Steve, um, directly to you regarding the Bank of America site. And that is because, huh? The yeah. one on Winfield, right? Yeah. So I saw a rendering and it's like, I don't know, I don't, it's like three rows of, um, it looks like a duplex condo unit, Four. something like mm -hmm. that. Is it true that if the TOD was in place right now, like I, like I said today, and they applied today with the same rendering that I saw, would they, so it wouldn't be approved because the TOD is in place? Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to go into too many specifics about that since it's a pending application, but I can answer those kind of questions because that's kind of a, uh, gen, you know, generic question more or less. So if the plan was, si since they've applied under the existing regulations, what we're discussing and contemplating can't be considered by the Zoning Commission as part of their deliberations on the application. So they're, they're under the, the existing rules that are in place today. Um, okay. had, the, had the plan been implemented in the zoning regulations, modified and the zoning map changed to reflect the changes that are proposed, and then they had Which is applied- from neighborhood business, yeah. Right, to the, to the residential zone. They could not do what they're proposing today. I, uh, one thing I was going to ask, because Mich Michelle, who's on, um, on the call as well, is kind of leading our review. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask her to take a look at is see if she can do like a, see how many lots she could get out of that. So I, I forgot, I think it's like a half acre, that piece of property, plus or minus. So if you subdivided that, how many lots could you get? Is it three lots? Is it four lots? If it's three lots, for example, the maximum number of units they could put there would be six. So that would be three, the theoretically three, two families. So it would look appreciably different than what's on the table right now. And the reason I'm asking this is because um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're doing the plan is so that people don't come and just do whatever they want to do with the existing regulations because they can come and do 16 units and a small parcel, but then if the TOD is in place, I wanna think that that gives them a cap as of high end density, right? So that's why if, I mean, I don't know how long does it takes for the application or how, how um, the timing on the application as it is right now, but if the TOD gets approved before their application get, gets approved, then they need to submit a different kind of renderings right now, no? No, no. They, they're they're under the, so the, the way the there? law works. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, the way the okay. law works is they're, the rules they play by are the rules that are in place now, since they've submitted their application. Even if we pass this tonight, you know, it, it's still, still not applicable. Um, just to, another way to answer your initial question, say this area was, say this property was on East Avenue, for example, and was in the new proposed zone, I can guarantee you would no, not look like what they're proposing. You know, for five or six different reasons we've laid out in the plan in terms of the required right. public realm space, the amenity space, the, the sidewalk width, the design standards, it would look vastly different than it looks right now. See, see something, is, just... something is rotten in the state of in the city of Rome. I mean, there must be a way of stopping this. I mean, this is where we need the, 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 the design. I think we're all referring to 93 Winfield. It looks absolutely atrocious by anybody's standards. Planners, architects, whoever it is, let alone residents. Okay, can I just jump in here and just remind Steve it's a pending application? And I don't know if Stephanie is back on here because it's I am. Before his, Okay, so oh yeah, um, good point. Yeah, I don't want to get too into the weeds about okay. this. But yeah, but like I, I do want to I do want to ask a question not related to his application, so you guys don't get in trouble. Is um, 
you just said that under under the changes that we're looking at for East Avenue, that the application he proposed there would would not um, materialize on East Avenue, but the number of units he's proposing certainly would. So are you just talking about aesthetics versus how he laid it out in the setbacks? Um, mathematically, it potentially could have the same number of units, but or or, he, or more. Or more because of the, because of the parcel um, assemblage, but even but even on that same size parcel, it could have more, right? No, I think he's at the max. Michelle, can you? Yeah, without getting into the specifics yeah, not, not again about him. the I'm application, the same size parcel under the new POD regulation, literally on East Avenue in the village, what would be the the, the maximum? Because he's at seventeen. Yeah. Right. He, or, he can't. So it's. Go ahead, Michelle. No, I didn't understand the question. So for it, for it in neighborhood business, what's the max? Under the, no, under the new. So neighborhood business, you would have been restricted to um, to 12 under without the special permit. But under the new East Avenue, oh my God, I forget what we're calling this thing, Steve. The alleged East, East district. Village, T TOD district. If you, if you took that same size parcel, I'm suggesting that on East Avenue, this fellow would actually have more units, could have more units than 17. It would just be configured differently. Maybe no. not. I'd like some, I'd like no. actually somebody to look at it based on Judith's question. Sorry. Yeah. That's, Sorry, I think um, that's what we were gonna try and just compare ex what you guys were discussing in regards to that lot, what kind of area that that lot has and what the need the new TOD would provide comparing it to what's allowed now. We haven't done that, but that's what I was we, we were going to compare stuff like that. No, he, he couldn't. So just to answer that question, that's pretty easy to answer is if you have the same size parcel with the same allowed density, you can't get any addi more additional units. It's just dividing that say it's a half an acre. You just divide that by 1650 and that's the maximum number of units you can get. But what I was saying was with the, the proposed regulations in the village district, mm -hmm. the um, wider sidewalks, the um, public amenity space, the um, design standards and all those things and the public realm that's required are going to curtail the development envelope somewhat. And the design standards are going to lead to a completely different look than what's being proposed there. So he might, guess, it's possible he could get the same number of units, but it's not going to look anything like that. Right. Okay. Right. And that's, and that's my question because it's not just the aesthetics. It's also still the number. So, you know, no matter where you pick it up and plop it and what it looks like, people are still concerned with the number. But if they, and that, that really speaks to Emily's point from two weeks ago about the fact that um, it's the fit studies and how you're actually looking at each parcel that determines um, what those maximum build outs are going to be. Right, because you also have certain square footage requirements for public realm. There are setbacks uh, that have to go in. There's the parking requirements that have to go in. Once you start putting all of those together, you shrink the ground floor footprint. Um, you can still only go up so high. So right. even if you get X number of units per acre, you still can't necessarily fit them into your building envelope. Yeah. So those other pieces start restricting the size and the shape yeah. of the building, which then starts and, restricting. And all that would, would be good to know because we, you know, Ian and A has been accused of fear mongering in terms of numbers based on just what the fit out could have been from what Steve gave us from 1200 to, to 1500, and the number is legally different. But, you That's know, we're, we're looking say. at with what the numbers that were given to us and, um, you know, not using it for fear mongering, we were using it kind of in facts and in data. So if it's significantly why, different, yeah. then correct us and we'll put it out there. That's right. We're happy to do that. So that's why I delved back into the files that we had to see what um, other studies we'd done. And so I want to build up that susceptibility to change chapter. Exactly, Diane. So you have those numbers. So and the explanation of how they're calculated in more detail. Steve, I think the issue on, on height and density too, the more we start to, you know, people kick it around and um, people try to be more open-minded. I do have to say a lot of people come to the table now 
with having resigned themselves to the fact that it's a done deal. Um, and so, you know, how do you kind of do, you know, we use words like damage control or mitigate the impact on quality of life. And so um, E and an A, and I think you've seen in letters that are coming in too, I think people are just wanting to say that it can't be hard and fast. And at this point before public hearings, there should be still an opportunity to say, this could be compromised. It could be compromised either by capping the height and density to something that's lower, and maybe that's where it is today, and I know your feelings on that, but you can also reduce the amount of the you know, potential population by restricting the size of the area. And so even following your own fundamental tenets of POD that say, the, the, the densest would be like literally right at the train station. And as you move away, you get less density and less height. Um, one of the things that came up at the ENNA board was that, you know, most of us weren't opposed to the height and density if we knew that it was really considered for just, you know, specific parcels. And that the things that are in the plan that look like they might protect the community from having a canyonization of East Avenue left and right going all the way down the corridor. Sometimes those things don't protect us. And, and we saw you know, comments from you that um, answering the public that where someone asked you, you know, what if something came in after the fact that after the plan was approved and you said, and, and you thought that it met, you know, what would have been considered um, in line with this, you actually said that you'd consider going back and amending the plan to, um, to allow it. And that really leaves people uncomfortable. So now, now we have a level of discomfort based on, you know, I'd like to, their teeth I'd like to see where I said that comment yeah. in the context of the question again. Yeah, I, I'll send it to you. It's, you know, tell it's, me it's where it was clear. in the video and I'll watch it yeah. again. Yeah, I'll, gi I'll, I'll give it to you. Because the question was, what would happen if somebody came in um, with something, you know, that, that wasn't in the plan, but, you know, that you thought that it would be you know, otherwise should be considered for the plan. And and, well, and that was that, the answer for it. So I'll send it to you verbatim because we have the transcript. Well, so. I, I well, think there's a difference the between, I think there's a difference between somebody who I, might have a good idea that to be included versus somebody that says, I'd like to build a five-story building on East Avenue and then, and then saying, well, that's okay. I think it seems to me that's where you're almost kind of that direction versus me saying, well, a use or something that was good or mm -hmm. tweaking this amenity bonus or something like that. Maybe those kind of changes I think should get looked at because, you know, all these exercises in, in some sense are theoretical and it gets down to the, you know, the, the fine detail when somebody actually starts applying it on a project by project basis. And I, I mean, I've had people that from folks I trust and folks I trust less who bring me, sometimes I said, look, you put this rule in, I think the idea was good, but here's how it works when I try to implement it. And we say, okay, that makes sense. Let's go back and revisit it and see how we can get it to get it to actually function on the ground. And if it's something minor like that, then, you know, I don't think anybody would argue with it. I think the fear is that something could get, you know, through and amend the plan to allow it that wouldn't even come back before the public to review it. Maybe it's a matter of defining um, what what level of change would re absolutely require that it has to come back to the public and and to a public hearing? Well, I mean, there's there's two different things there in, your, in what you're saying. One is if they amend an existing plan, and is that a minor change or a major no, change? No, 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 no. If you, you if you change. amended this plan, I'm saying so. So say this plan is adopted and it's part of the POCD. But do you have a compelling reason or application or um, something that comes before you where, where you feel it's worthwhile to amend the TOD plan is, is, is what they were talking about? Right. So, I mean, <clears throat> that's still a public process, though. That's not Steve saying this is a great idea and let's do it tomorrow. It's still got to go through those same steps. Okay, so any amendment of the plan, whether somebody used the word, you know, minor, major, yada, 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 if it's an amendment to the TOD plan, it would have to come back through the public process. 
Yeah, it's a there's a big difference between amending an applic plan as part of an application versus amending right. zoning text or amending a, uh, the POCD. Those are two different animals. Okay. All right. Um, did anyone have any feedback on the appendices, um, transportation analysis, or anything? I'm curious to hear what um, other people thought because we found it, you know, we, we, Steve, we talked about this early on and I think even you weren't really satisfied with it. You were going back to the consultants to um, give us some more teeth in this thing and um, I'll express my concerns. I'm just wondering if anybody else read it or had any concerns with it. Anything specific? Because I know there were a list of changes that got put in and clarifications that we sent to Emily from the first draft to the second draft that were put in. Mm -hmm. um, I could I could email back out that list of changes. I don't know if there's anything additional beyond that. Yeah, maybe, maybe so that I can compare the two. But they still come back with a document where they where they even even to the point like where they use the word um, potentially a lot. Like it could potentially gridlock. Um, it could be uh, potentially favorable. Um, it, and it's here if, if you even just do like a find on that word. So we're making decisions here based on this transportation and some, some of the traffic analysis in here, even with it, that we don't consider facts and data. So if you're saying it potentially gridlocks at um, Osborne and yada yada, well, give us, the, give us the facts and data. Under what conditions does it gridlock? How often does it gridlock? You know, are we talking about 4th of July fireworks gridlock or are we talking about morning, noon and night gridlock? Um, that, that was in general. And then there's some specific stuff on here. Um, within, and I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to, to type it up, but there were, there were some other concerns with um, their data sources and this may not be able to help because I just read actually the traffic analysis for 93 Winfield, by the way, Judith. The, the data analysis that seems to be the standard everyone is using on traffic and transportation is from 2017. Is that really the most current stuff we have? Because even in the past three years, we've had some phenomenal changes here that would impact this stuff. That seems ancient history. Well, that. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into the specifics of that application again, but the, no, no, I mean it, this, know, this, this, it within this plan, the transportation appendix B. Everything oh, in here is oh, referencing okay. 2017 and before, and actually, there's some stuff in here that referenced 2019 that's inaccurate. But I know you didn't want to deal with um, um, errors and things. Shouldn't this be well, more? Well, I mean, I'm trying to think of any. The Spinnaker project was the last project really built out on that road. I mean, there hasn't been anything where there's, you know, specific, unless uh, the city or the state has done counts on East Ave, I don't think there's any other projects that would have necessitated um, updated traffic counts. But wouldn't you can't RKG, do those now anyway, because RKG they're not going to reveal done it as part of their purview with the, with this plan? Who is that? I'm sorry? With, R, with RKG? And V5. RKG is the okay. economic analyst. Oh, I'm thinking, I'm sorry. I say I just said RKG. I said it twice. I'm sorry. NV5. So if they go out not there and they see the most current count. data was relative to 230 East Avenue and say, not the Sono collection, which we won't even get into the how restrictive their study was. So they look at it and say, but this is the best we have is 2017. They don't try to, to do anything on their own. They just use the existing data. Not unless it's in the scope of work. Traffic counts is a very specific uh, um, uh, uh, task. And if it's not in the scope of work, there's no associated with it. It's not standard for that to do unless they've been contracted to do that. You don't, you don't just go and update traffic counts. You have to be scoped out to do it. It's a significant effort. Well, I would hope that they considered all sources that might have had something more updated, including um, looking at Vanessa, maybe TVW um, or other. No, usually we, we provide and also, you know, after um, the traffic count is done, um, 
if we need another one, we always ask if someone already have done in that street or in that area. Uh -huh. um, so they they definitely try to use the numbers that the were the latest the one that was there. All right. I just I think it's worth looking um, out to, and one of the board members did the analysis and pointed out a lot of that in here. Two things that stuck out like a sore thumb is the fact that they're referencing the data for 230 East Avenue, um, but they're talking about it not even have broken ground at that point. And some of the components of 230 um, have changed since then. And they referenced the Sono Collection Mall but at a point where they haven't identified um, what the overflow is through East Norwalk when I-95 is backed up. And we even pointed out that, that um, technology like Waze and these other GPS apps um, are routing off of the highway, um, north and south, depending on what the backlog is, to come down East Avenue to Straffolino Bridge and then um, into South Norwalk. That's well, I, disturbing on a number of levels, and, and it's not factored in here. Well, it's tricky to accommodate um, the overflow from the mall because the mall you know, was open for, what, six right. months, and then it closed, and then it's opened, right. and 230 is not built yet, so they can't, we can't wait on the study to get those numbers. And then you know, doing traffic counts right now is absolutely worthless because it's going to show everything for the most part fantastic. There's no, you know, there's so much less volume on the roads in general right now. It's, you know, anybody who's doing a traffic study right now is, you know, going to get a big asterisk next to it because it's not going to have any validity right now. I just, I, I think these things need to go back and be you know, looked at in it. and I think some of, there were some questions too on there, the data that they were using from Metro North on the ridership there. That one, I think you did get updated for us, Steve. The numbers were yeah, wildly off the mark the first time, so they look newer. But we did ask, and I don't think we asked in writing, it was at one of the meetings, I think, where um, we had the question come up to see if you could provide us with the ridership um, analysis between the East Norwalk Station, um, two things, I'm sorry. The ridership analysis and the parking analysis um, between East Norwalk Station um, and um, Rowayton Station. We, we wanted to understand what those numbers were. And oh, it, uh, and I don't remember could, that specific question, but it's, yeah. you know, okay. Diane, if there's, can you get us a, like a, a list of these and then we can yeah. see what was already done and see what's yep. not done and what can be addressed? Yep, you can do that. I mean, because these things, for the most part, I don't think really alter the plan at all. They, you know, they, I don't think that changes the recommendations or the, or the bulk of things, especially if it's an appendix matter. I mean, I'm fine to, you know, correct inaccuracies, but at the end of the day, whatever happens down the road with this area, with any of these projects, they're all going to have to go through their own individual site planning process. and. Right. Yeah, but, but, but the, the decision to, to adopt the plan and put it into the POCD is, is, de is predicated on the data that's in these appendices. So long before you get an application that gets scrutinized on its own merits, Steve, you have the land use bodies and the agencies in the city deciding on the plan based on what they're reading in these appendices. And, you know, that, that's what my point is. So, um, just We're not even going to get into zoning because we already know, you know, the issue with 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 height. And how the the objection to the um, if if there's not necessarily an objection to the point system. The objection is to the point system that is in here, and there's not a comfort level to say that that's just an example and that would be modified after the fact. Um, if that's the key, then you need to you know take that out and just say you know, it's going to be determined later. The fact that it's in here, somebody can just point to it, and we know this happens, you point to it and say, here it is, it's in the, it's in the plan. Okay. <laughs> See, I didn't even reply back. I was pretty good. I hold my tongue. Yeah. Um, the design also, guidelines, sorry. we're going we're gonna to ask someone to do an independent, um, hopefully, pro bono peer review for us quick on those, because, again, it's 
way over our head, so we have no comment on that. The other ones I'll email in to you because then you can tell me where they were changed or we missed the boat. A lot of these things came in from the um, Ian and A presented the, the oversight committee and um, Harriman with two lengthy documents that were page by page. And um, honestly, Emily, I just haven't had the bandwidth to do side by side and to see what made the cut and what didn't. So probably saw his op-ed, although short-lived. Um, about desegregate Connecticut and the. Oh, Daphne, you might be on it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, it was me, but um, I just wanted to say one thing about the amenities. Sorry, uh, double scheduling. But um, to Diane's point, I would also be in favor of at least writing something, like saying this is still to be determined or mm -hmm. something to make it clear that that is not final. I could certainly do an form. introduction, yeah, intro to the design guidelines and the zoning, explaining what it means that they're in an, in an appendix. Yep. Yeah, and then maybe explain like the, which body or, or people would ultimately decide what the points are, mm -hmm. so that that's not happening in you know in kind of a in a kind of a vacuum there. Yep. Um, we we're also going to submit a couple other things, Steve, just so you know, and Emily. Um, one is that when, when you look through the plan, it's kind of like it was hard for people to discern to just say what is the plan, because you had this big document that was filled with a lot of stuff. And then within that, you had two components. You had one that's called the top 10 action items, which kind of chunked everything together at a high level. And that's in the beginning of the plan. And then in, in, in the end of the plan in section seven, you had the implementation and the timetable and each one of those components. Um, and so we wanted to be able to really do the analysis on those because those really are what are defining the plan as best we can tell. So we're going to provide some feedback on those. Because one, one of the questions that um, comes up, Steve, is like if there was no TOD um, study and plan and grant and everything, if we look at the uh, 52, I think it's 52 recommendations that are in the implementation plan, this document here that groups them all together, um, there's a large percentage of those that the residents would feel that there's nothing um, prohibitive from um, prohibiting us from implementing that now in the city. And it's just an interesting topic that's come up that just says, you know, if this TOD thing went away, um, we could still do a whole bunch of these things, improve the quality of life and provide a, a community that residents and um, and, um, and, you know, retailers and stuff would want to come to, you know, a safe, beautiful, um, you know, community that's walkable and has a, you know, educated workforce and, um, you know, good workforce pool. There's, there's other things that people consider when they're coming to live or work. Well, but there's a reason you put things into a plan and, and mm -hmm. you know, and that could be, I mean, I guess to your point, it could be a separate plan of just those 52 things. But when you put things into a, a plan like this, it helps at the capital budget funding stage because the city's mm -hmm. looked at this as something they consider important. And it also makes you eligible for grant funding. So mm -hmm. say there's another TOD grant round that comes yeah, out in good point. a year yeah. or so. And then we say, okay, well, in 2020, we adopted this TOD plan. Uh, one recommendation in the plan is to do X project, um, we'd like you to fund, you know, 50% of this project and the city's going to put in the other 50%. That strengthens our argument tenfold by doing that. Okay, that's a good point. And what, and then what another process thing, and, and then I'll stop here. The, um, you, you started to lay out the process for us in terms of the approvals and everything and how this cycles through and then ultimately gets adopted. There's two things that get adopted. There's the plan, and then there's the amendment to the POCD that acknowledges the plan. In the in the um, these um, implementation things that are segmented out, um, does each one of these things point to a, a bullet point in the POCD so that the compliance of, is um, is linked? Because you normally do that. You normally point to the POCD item that it complies with or is achieving. Oh, oh. Um no, not, it's not mapped directly like that. So I think if 
if can I'm it thinking be, about be, because in the capital budget, that's one of the requirements now is that it gets mapped to that, and then this this isn't. No, that's a good point, and I I let me t I'll tackle that down the road with the finance department how to handle that. I think what we could do is. No, I think that it is just a, an over layer the way that I see over the POCG. You know what I mean? So the POCG is still yeah. the base, but for that specific area, we're going to follow the GOD. Yeah, I, I think Diane's point, it's a, it's a fair point, I think, because if say, say you submit your capital request, Vanessa, and mm -hmm. you know, usually point to a specific item in the POCD, but it, the TOD plan is only in there by reference, I think. But there is a there is the ability to write in additional text where I think then they could just copy and paste from the TOD plan and say this is the specific line item recommendation and provide a copy of the page. DPW is smarter than some of the other groups in terms of how they present that. Right. So they have more backup. So I think that's what I would recommend. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I would defer to Brian on this, but I think in our planning commission, that you know, you guys are being more stringent about that to say, you know, just don't give us some wishy-washy stuff and where you think it fits in. You actually need to point to the POCD item that that would um, that that would meet. Steve, my last question: um, when you when you're walk, walking um, E and A through um, the approval stuff, you mentioned West Cog, but you didn't tell us the mechanism of how this gets through to West Cog. Is it that there? blessing the POCD again, or do that they do they approve this plan on its own? I have to ask Westcog what they do under that scenario. So we referred this out to them. And when we referred it, we sent them the amendment to the POCD, the uh, link to the plan and the link to the appendices. So they have all that. And the way the legal notice reads is we're, you know, including this uh, TOD plan as part of the POCD. So it, I, I would hope that they would actually look at the TOD plan itself, because that's what they're supposed to do is to look at right. uh, conformance with the regional plan and then right. any impacts on neighboring communities, in which case that would just probably be Westport in all reality. Right. When did you refer to them, to Westcom? Oh, uh, emailed it out, what's today? Thursday, Wednesday, mm -hmm. yesterday. Oh, okay, just this week, okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, just real quick. This is John. Hi, hi Steve. Um, I think it's important to mention the uh, East Norwalk widening project when we speak about the TOD. Um, I've had, you know, a lot of uh, constituents and people in the area who are currently used to this boondoggle of a uh, access way to their homes now and and not envisioning what they're going to what how it's going to look after this project is complete and i speak to, i speak about the the uh the east norwalk uh, avenue projects um because i think a lot of people aren't really familiar with that side of it and and, and to my eyes these the tod and the, and the widening project kind of coincide and overlap one another so um, I think, you know, if moving forward and even when this eventually comes to the planning committee, if you could, you know, also present that side of it would be, I think, helpful for people getting an idea, especially those people familiar with the roadways and how, uh, I guess, dysfunctional you could say they are currently. Um, and, and I know I, we touched- I might ask Vanessa to help with that. <laughs> and, I, and I know Thanks, we touched- Thanks, John. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, real quick, I know we touched on it before with the Bank of America uh, proposed development. Uh, Steve, can you just tell me where in the approval process that is right now? Yeah, I, I, without getting into any specifics, and I'm happy to do that offline, but yeah, they just submitted the application to us last week. I think it was last week. So they, they're not even scheduled to be on an agenda yet with the Zoning Commission. I think the earliest that will happen will be August, I think it's the 19th, it's a Wednesday, if I have the date correct. So that'll be the first it could be on it. Um, we, Michelle's been going through it and sent them a list of uh, questions that they need and items they need to address. So if they can't get that done by a reasonable time before the 19th, then we'll push them back to September. 
and then the commission's got to schedule a public hearing date. So the earliest you'll, the public hearing will be will be mid-September or beginning of October. So the project will be presented to the Zoning Commission and then following that it'll be um, go to public uh, hearing and then up for a vote that following month? Is that pretty much the gist yeah, of it? Yeah, they, so they, they might vote on it that maybe it takes only one hearing or maybe it takes two hearings. It's without getting in, without seeing it happen, it's hard to say when. So it could be the end of October. Yeah, that's feasible. Okay. And uh, let me go ahead. But I was just going to say a point in that too, too John, because Ian and A is closely involved with that, um, with that project. And um, it's likely on that one, we're going to ask, um, for the public hearing to be held open. Um, and a lot of times they'll accommodate that just because of the, oh my gosh, it could be two or three hours of, um, you know, the, the, um, the land attorney and all the experts and everything. So that could be held open, hopefully not voted on the same night. And then when you, when you get through, I have an interesting thing here for you, John, on East Avenue, I want to read to the group. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, just, I mean, that, I, I gotta be, honest you know that that project concerns me and i but i also know my role as a councilman i i mean and, and what i can and cannot do and steve you're probably aware of, the, of those limitations as far as uh, advocating or opposing or playing an active role in, in what zoning decides on but to the group i mean that that, pr that project does 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 concern me i think i think knowing the lot seeing what's being I don't know how accurate those rendering renderings are that I saw, or, or, or if that's what's going to be presented to the zoning uh, commission. But um, <laughs> the, knowing the lot, no familiar with Bank of America as my bank for many, many years. I mean, that's for what I saw. That's that's a little uh, too much and too too small of a place, especially in that residential area. But anyway, I won't. I'll, I'm sure others have questions. But thank you. Um, so, hey, John. Uh, speaking of the future um, roadway improvements for East Avenue. Um, the NB5 um, appendix where they did the, um, all of the analysis, I, I do have to say one thing for NB5, they did, they did call it as they saw it on a lot of this stuff and they didn't hold any punches or try to sugarcoat stuff. But I'll just read you the segment here what they were talking about and because um, it may be cause for concern. And they said, um, this is on page four of their document. It said, by improving the roadway throughput, and maintaining two southbound lanes of traffic from I-95 um, in the north to Van Zant to the south, you know, but they're going to adjust the slaloms and, and straighten everything out. They, they said that it, it's possible that in the short term, the volume of cut through traffic may experience a reduction. However, it should be noticed that induced traffic or additional traffic attracted to the area due to the improved conditions and including trucks has the potential to increase in the long term where levels of traffic congestion could actually return to the existing condition levels on East Avenue and thus could also return residential cut through uh, traffic back to existing levels. So they recognize that you have this period of time where then, you know, people are kind of in pace to go through there and it doesn't take a whole lot of time for things to get either get back to where they were or worse. And I think it's worth keeping in mind as we um, consider both components of this plan. Thank you. I mean, I'm trying to be optimistic about that probably something that's, you know, been on, on my radar for over close to a decade now. I mean, um, I mean yes, did I, did we, did we support the, the raising of the bridge to allow for 18 wheelers? I mean, I, I'm the one who, you know, drafted the resolution back when and, and fought the OT and I mean, I'm still no fan of it, you know, to allow access to Van Zandt going in that direction. I mean, can we predict the future? No, but uh, I mean, I do think that this widening and, and what's going on and, and you know, easements we're going to take. I mean, I mean, to your point, Diane, yeah, I mean, like who really knows, but, Logistically and just, uh, I mean, you would think that the the correction of the lanes and knowing what's there now, I'm 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 optimistic that I think it will help. But you know, I mean, you to your point of saying there may be increased traffic because of the flow and uh, the convenience of it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the what if that's lingering over it. But I'm hopeful. What's the next steps for the oversight committee, Steve? Are we, what happens now? 
Um, I don't know if I have another step at the moment, because um, so the, the the planning commission has got the amendment, they've got the plan. Um, I'd like to get them the list of edits, and we had a bunch tonight, and then I'm going to also expand that to include the, all the the typos and grammatical ones, because I I always like to let them know we know those are there. That way, they don't spend 10 minutes talking about you misspelled this and misspelled that. Um, so we'll get them that list and I'll get that to the planning committee as well. The one big item um, that Emily and I need to talk about is the fit test part of it. I want to, you know, if, that, if that's going to change that section a lot, I'd rather have them and everybody else see that first. So it, it's yeah. not a after the fact surprise. So that would be good. Um, and other than that, I don't, I don't know what, if there is another next step that has to happen, um, you know, it, it, possible? I don't, I don't have anything on my calendar at the moment. I can always take that section out, Steve. I don't have to amend it. I just thought it might be useful. But if it's going to cause more problems than uh, it solves, then, you know, I can just well, do the uh, edits that we have now. I, don't, I certainly don't want to uh, add headaches yeah. to anybody. No, I don't think it would be. I, I think that, you know, the, the, the architect, uh, Mr. Garcia, I don't know if he's right or wrong about that parking thing i'd like to you know i don't i the last thing i want to do is is h hang my hat on a on a some on parking scenarios if, if in reality they don't work so if, if we can get a little more clarity on that and i have some other thoughts of having some other folks take a look at that as well as right. we go forward but you know this the zoning um the zoning appendix has got to get looked at by the zoning commission later on as part of a whole separate public hearing process that's got to go through the whole <laughs> set of hearings and everything else. So you know, it's going to get further refined, which we talked about, but I, I'd like to get a little more clarity on that. And we can talk about that when, you know, you can, we can email and set up a time to chat about it. Yeah, let's talk about that tomorrow. So we get, I, I have to say that if I'd uh, known that it was August 5th, I might have uh, held my tongue. <laughs> well, that, there was reason for that. Yeah, no, I know. I, Emily, I are, you, are you are you talking about revisiting the fit test stuff? No, not redoing the fit test stuff. Yeah. Absolutely not. Just adding okay. more information about it. Yeah. That's all. Well, I, I just want to say because I'm, you know, trying to be friendly and cooperative and as I always am, um, that that's probably the best thing that you can spend some time on now if you're looking to garner goodwill and some public support. Because, okay. you know, we got the villagers with the pitchforks with in the absence of you doing that we're using the only other numbers we have. And so people, you know, people are, like the example we use, I'll just give you this quick, the, because um, Emily won't know about the purple house on, um, what the heck road was it? The purple house, Flax Hill? Anybody? I think it's Flax Hill. Judith, okay. So there's a famous purple house in Norwalk, there was. And so, and, and it's on this road with all, you know, traditional paints and whatever. And so the notion would be that, that there was nothing in zoning that prohibited them from having it, you know, purple or pink or whatever. And the idea is that every street, every house on Flax Hill could have been painted purple. Mm. And so people would look at that and go, oh my God, we allow purple? Every single house could be purple. And so there is this example that you say then, but what is the likelihood of it happening? Mm -hmm. And that's where Steve comes in to play. But, but in the absence of somebody saying, this is why it wouldn't happen, people still would say every house could be purple. In the end, only one was purple. And sadly, when new owners painted over it, I think people were literally crying because it was such an icon in the community and a landmark. But it's an, ex it's an example. So I think if you... If, if you were going to spend your time on something and you wanted to have less angst and stuff going on, it would be in that area. Mm -hmm. Because you'd be painting a more realistic picture. I'm not saying it still wouldn't be opposed because there's, you know, for a whole lot of reasons, but I think it would lessen the blow if people had a more visual and better understanding of what is real. Can, can I, cl I want to clarify one thing on the density and I don't want to start a whole new conversation, but I, I, I should be pointed out that number that I used is not just the village district. It's also the change to the I-1. So that, that's significant. So Emily's numbers and my numbers might not be as far off as they, right. you know, you may think, but 
Okay. My change was the number I gave was both if every square inch of the two zones got the full change, that's the number that could get realized. Right. Yeah, and I think we understood that. And well, then because those two zones are so closely together that it's, you know, it's almost like one. But yes, we understood that, Steve. Okay. Steve, do you think you're going to have anything else for me? I, I, I will unfortunately have to get you something else. So if you guys are okay, I would disconnect. Well, I think we're about done anyway. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so I will email out a couple of things and then I mean, I, Emily and I will chat and then we come up with a, uh, I'll send out a separate list of all the changes and then the probably that maybe there'll be one more significant um, edit that will get looked at as part of this. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Right, and everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Michelle. Bye. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'll be talking to you on 93. Yes. I'll send you stuff. Okay. See you then. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>